All right, this is Professor Ryan Paul, and this is my third lecture on Othello, Race, and Shakespeare. So first to review some of the concepts that we've discussed. First, the idea of race in the modern world as a socially constructed identity. That, it is, that is, it is identity constructed through the social interactions of people, and it's based on physical differences that are perceived as essential or defining. In the Renaissance, they did not necessarily have the same conception of identity. So what we call race today was really a, a complex mix of different ideas in the Renaissance. So it had to do with religious difference. Their, their understanding of the difference between Christianity and Islam coincided with our understanding of racial difference. Uh, skin color, the physical differences that today define race were associated also with moral or allegorical ideas, the connection of blackness with demonism, the devil, the demonic. Uh, it indicated cultural difference and difference in cultural values between the East and the West, between the Christian and the non-Christian. And of course, it was also, uh, also discussed by pseudoscientific discourses that attempted to explain uh, difference in skin color as a result of temperament, as a result of physiological differences, and so forth. And so ultimately, the idea that there is no fixed meaning of blackness in the Renaissance, although generally it is uh, viewed negatively, but there's a, not a fixed understanding of it. And so it's changing, transforming. Before we look at the play itself, just a little bit more background. First, on European attitudes towards Moors and the Ottoman Empire. Um, Moors, the Moors were the Islamic conquerors of medieval Spain and North Africa, and they were part of the Ottoman Empire, a large Islamic empire that was an expanding military and political power encroaching into European territory uh, during this period. So that's part of the geopolitical context for understanding both who Othello is and who he represents and the other political situation, um, the, the background or context of the play, uh, the storyline that's going on of the conflict between Venice and the Turks over Cyprus that is the narrative background to Othello's story. As I've been stressing, when it comes to the ideas of racial and cultural difference and blackness, there was no set understanding of the meaning of these forms of difference, no one un interpretation of what this meant among European peoples. Similarly, there are complicated attitudes towards the Ottoman Empire and Muslim, uh, growing Muslim power. On the one hand, they were recognized as fellow people of the book. They had the same scriptural uh, bases in the biblical texts that Christians and Jews read and hold as sacred. So they, there was that kinship there. They were also admired for their great military prowess, for their administrative and political skill, uh, and for their great learning. It is the Arabs of the Ottoman Empire in the Middle East that preserved much of the learning and wisdom, uh, much of the art and knowledge from ancient Greece and Rome. So they really brought the Renaissance to Europe in many ways. Um, on the other hand, they were feared and denigrated for uh, what was believed to be a tendency towards violence, uh, lustfulness. They were seen to uh, often criticized for their harsh treatment of women. Um, an interesting geopolitical fact from the perspective of the English, which were a Protestant country, the Ottoman Empire was not a direct threat because they were growing in uh, conflicting with southern Europe, that's where their growth was, they were more often in conflict with Catholic countries. So that took some of the pressure off of Protestant countries because their potential opponents were being distracted by the Ottoman threat. So there's a complex geopolitical relationship going on. Do you side with your fellow Christian countries against um, the Islamic enemy, or do you side with the Islamic enemy against the Catholic enemy? Uh, and finally, there is a fantasy slash anxiety about turning Turk. That is, there were many Europeans who were sailors, adventurers, pirates, whatever. Uh, they might have been captured by, in, by, by Islamic pirates or prisoners of war. 
Uh, but many converted to Islam, some voluntarily, some uh, required to do so. But in doing so, they were allowed to live and work freely in the Ottoman Empire, and many did so uh, in order to pursue financial freedom, financial wealth, and to pursue their own career as pirates or sailors. So there's always this fear of the seduction of turning Turk, that one might be forced to, or perhaps seduced, into becoming um, a Turk, an other, a foreigner. So now let's look at Othello, the Moor, that he is called, more often than he's called Othello, he is called the Moor in this play. Um, and why is he here? Let's first think about why is he in Venice? Well, the reality was, in real life, Venice did not have a standing army because of their laws, because of their republican uh, governmental system. They did not have a standing army in order to prevent any one faction from taking over. Uh, so they relied on international mercenary forces in order to protect themselves. So that's the real world context, so that there would be people like Othello, people who were not Venetian, serving in Venice's army. Um, Othello is referred to as a Moor, so that signifies some dark skin, some foreign background, but he doesn't He's apparently not Islamic. He is not Christ, He's not a, a Islamic. He's apparently been Christianized. And even at one point in the play, he talks about he accuses his men of turning Turk when they're acting violently and inappropriately. So he's a Moor, but he's apparently a Christian Moor. Uh, so there's always that conflict there. Can he be a Moor and a Christian? Can he be Christian despite his dark skin? Um, what does that suggest? Is the dark skin, again, something that differentiates him completely from, quote-unquote, us, the Christians, or uh, can he become, quote-unquote, like us? And finally, within the play, we see, and this is echoing real-world developments, a uh, real-world history, that Venice was in conflict with the Turks, with the Ottoman Empire, over the rulership of Cyprus. And that is the political background, that's the political story, the, the military story that's going on in the background of the play, and that's the reason why Othello and Iago are initially sent to Cyprus. So let's think about what blackness means in Othello, and a few questions to ask to start us off. How is blackness imagined and interpreted? What are the images that are associated with blackness? What are the words that are used to describe or intimate or suggest blackness? Who talks about blackness in this play? And how do they talk about it? What do they say? And finally, what are the different ways that one can be quote-unquote black, both literally and figuratively in this play? One of the first mentions of blackness comes in the first act, first scene, when Iago and Rodrigo visit Brabantio, Desdemona's father, to warn him that, uh, to inform him that Desdemona has eloped with Othello. And Iago says, even now, now, very now, an old black ram is tupping your white you. Arise, arise, awake the snorting citizens with the bell, or else the devil will make a grandsire of you. A few lines later, he says, because we have come to do you service and you think we are ruffians, you'll have your daughter covered with a Barbary horse. You'll have your nephews neigh to you. You'll have coursers for cousins and genets for Germans. And then finally, your daughter and the Moor are now making the beast with two backs. So first, let's notice how Iago associates blackness with animality, with images of animals. He describes him as a black ram and a Barbary horse. And Barbary, in particular, is the northwest African coast uh, associated with the Ottoman Empire. It's part of their uh, territories. And also, of course, has a suggestion of barbarian, someone who is uncivilized, uh, animalistic, and violent. And both of these animals, horses and rams, are often associated with lust. And so they suggest Othello's animalistic sexuality and physicality. And the descriptions of sex also debase Demona because they describe the act in animalistic terms. They don't talk about love or sex. He says, tupping and the beast with two backs. So there's something monstrous, unnatural, grotesque about this image of 
Othello uh, tupping Desdemona. There's also a link here made between masculine identity and female virtue that we've seen again and again. Aegeus and Hermia, Hero and Leonato, the idea that the daughter's virtue reflects upon the father's identity. So Desdemona's sexual transgression here threatens Brabantio's identity because the devil will make a grandsire of you. Brabantio will be grandfather then to devilish children. That's that's part of his family now, part of his identity. And his nephews are named coursers and genets. These are all words for other types of horses. So all of Brabantio's family will become animals. And thus, by extension, Brabantio too will be a part of this. And then finally, there's a possible pun. And he says, tupping your white you, a pun on white Y-O-U, you. So Othello's violation of Desdemona is in a sense, a violation of Brabantio's selfhood. This is a penetration, a violation of who Brabantio is. He's being tupped just as his daughter is being tupped. These initial animalistic and grotesque descriptions contrast with what we first see as Othello's positive self-image. As he says to Iago when he finds out that Brabantio is looking for me, "'Tis yet to know. I fetch my life and being from men of royal siege, and my demerits may speak unbonneted to as proud a fortune as this that I have reached." That is, I am by myself, from my own culture, royal, we are noble, and thus I have not exceeded my grasp or my station by marrying Desdemona, a senator's daughter. I have, uh, I am worthy of this rank. She is worthy of me. I am worthy of her. I'm equal to her fortune. Brabantio, however, does not believe, does not buy Othello's royal lineage. And he plays up the idea of an unnatural attraction, that this is something that shouldn't happen. He calls Othello a foul thief. For all refer me to all things of sense, if she in chains of magic were not bound, whether a maid so tender, fair, and happy would have ever, to incur a general mock, run from her guardage to the sooty bosom of a thing such as thou, to fear, not to delight. He says similar lines to the Duke when he's presenting his case before the Duke of Venice, a maiden never bold of spirit so still and quiet that her motion blushed at herself. And she, in spite of nature, of years, of country, credit, everything, to fall in love with what she feared to look on? It is a judgment maimed and most imperfect that will confess perfection so could err against all rules of nature and must be driven to find out practices of cunning hell. So notice the language that Brabantio uses. He's playing on that traditional opposition between fair and foul. His, his daughter is fair, both in her whiteness and in her virtue or goodness, whereas Othello is foul, both in his physical appearance and in his nature, in his magic and deeds. He's foul or corrupted. So there's that suggestion of white versus black and the idea that these are opposites, that they should not be paired together, that she, someone who is fair, would flee from one who is foul. So in order to explain it, he says Othello must have done something uh, uh, evil, must have committed some crime, must have used witchcraft in order to woo her. Very similar to Aegeus's lines to uh, about Hermia in Midsummer Night's Dream, although Brabantio here seems much more to be literal about the sense that this is witchcraft whereas Aegeus is using it more as a metaphor for the gifts that Lysander gave Hermia. But here he talks about Desdemona's fear, that she would fear this thing because it's so monstrous. And so it had to have been cunning hell, some sort of dark trickery from hell, from beneath, that uh, uh, got her to fall in love with Othello. And of course then, again, playing on the traditional association of the devil as black. Um, Othello being the physical embodiment in black flesh of that devilish figure from Brabantio's perspective. Now both 
Othello and Desdemona present their cases in front of the Duke. And they both say that, Oth that Othello did not woo her actively, that in fact she pursued him just as much. She fell for him. And so the Duke gives his judgment to Brabantio. He says, if virtue no delighted beauty lack, your son-in-law is far more fair than black. And this ostensibly seems to be the Duke's attempt to calm Brabantio, saying, look, I know you're upset about this, but Othello is a good guy. He's not a bad person. From what I can tell from these stories, he didn't do anything wrong in wedding your daughter. But this statement is really complicated and really confusing, not only because it has this contradiction between fair and black, but because of the if statement there. So he's saying, essentially, if virtue is beautiful, if we can, if virtue has beauty, then Othello is fair, Othello is beautiful, is virtuous, even though he appears black. There's a beauty in his blackness. But that's somewhat paradoxical, again, considering the idea that fair and black are opposed in the, the European English mind. But of course, the question is, is virtue beautiful? Is beauty a sign of virtue? As we've seen throughout Shakespeare's plays, he's always challenging the idea that one can tell what is virtuous or good just by its appearance, that things that appear beautiful and virtuous may not be so, and it may actually be a sign of their lack of virtue. But even if things that are be virtuous are beautiful, if beauty is a sign of virtue, then how can Othello's blackness be a sign of fairness? Essentially, the Duke is saying that we should not believe the evidence of our eyes, not believe the evidence of our culture, if we are, again, Venetians or Shakespeare's English audience, and assume that Othello is fair even though he does not appear to be so to their eyes. So this is a sort of confusing statement, and it leads us to the question of, again, does the Duke really believe this? How do they really feel about Othello? Is there a settled uh, understanding of him as good or evil? And what's the relationship of that to his skin color and a cultural identity? It's all unsettled. It's all um, in flux. Now let's look at the way racial difference is also connected to sexuality. Iago says to Rodrigo, It cannot be long that Desdemona should continue her love to the Moor, nor he his to her. These Moors are changeable in their wills. The food that to him is now as luscious as locusts shall be to him shortly as bitter as cola quintita. She must change for youth. When she is sated with his body, she will find the error of her choice. And locusts here doesn't mean the insect. It's a reference to some type of, uh, possibly some type of sweet fruit. And cola quintita is a type of purgative. It's like a medicine that will either uh, be work as a laxative, perhaps, or as an emetic. That is something to make you vomit. So you can see the kind of disgusting images that Iago is already relying on in his discussion of the sexuality and the sexual relationship between Desdemona and Othello. So what is... Iago doing in this passage. He's describing both Othello and Desdemona as changeable, as lustful, as inconsistent, as controlled by their whims or bodily physical desires. And he describes both of their uh, sexual desires as a form of consumption or gluttony. Uh, it's food that they eat and she is sated or satisfied with his body. Once they have fed upon each other, they'll want something different different. So that idea of sexuality is, this isn't some sort of spiritual, loving, uh, tender, beautiful connection. It's a gluttonous consumption of flesh that each one is partaking of on the other's body. Um, and so here, both sexual and racial difference are read as signs of inferiority. That connection that we see, again, between white women and black men in the cultural imaginary that identifies them both as having similar, similarly inferior qualities to the idealized figure of the white male. Let's build on this connection between racial difference and sexual difference to look at the way Iago uh, similarly constructs women as duplicitous. In Act 2, Scene 1, he gives a little comic routine 
to Desdemona and his wife Amelia, and he tells a series of jokes about women. And although Desdemona laughs, she also says these are all old cliches. So let's look at the jokes. Um, the first one is, if she be fair and wise, fairness and wit, the one's for use, the other useth it. So her wit is for, it, it will use her fairness, her beauty, her virtue to her, her, to her advantage with the connotation that it'll be a sexual use. She uses her beauty, her sexuality to raise her status. The second joke, if she be black and there to have a wit, she'll find a white that shall her blackness fit. So even if she is dark haired or otherwise quote unquote black, which could also mean morally black, she will be witty enough, she'll still be witty enough to find a man who will fit her sexually. Um, and the, the white here is a pun on W-I-G-H-T, white, which is an old word for uh, person. So even the black-skinned or dark-haired dark woman who is considered less beautiful will still be able to find a man who will have sex with her. Iago's third joke, she never yet was foolish that was fair, for even her folly helped her to an heir. So even if she's beautiful but is stupid, doesn't have a wit, She's not really going to be foolish because her folly, her sexuality, will still get her an heir, a child. She'll still find someone to sleep with her. And then the final joke. There's none so foul and foolish thereunto, but does foul pranks, which fair and wise ones do. So even a foul, that is a black or lower class or corrupt, morally uh, uh, Im immoral, pr promiscuous woman, without wit, does the same foul pranks, the same sexual acts, as the fair women and the wise women do. And just one more example of this uh, that Iago says in a more serious vein to Othello when he's um, trying to convince Othello of Desdemona's infidelity. He says, in Venice, they, that is the women, in Venice, they do let God see the pranks. They dare not show their husbands. Their best conscious is not to leave it undone, but keep it unknown. So just as he says to the women, all women do these foul pranks, he says to Othello, only God knows what they're really doing. They hide their foulness from their husbands, but they still commit the foul acts, and only God knows about it. So this brings us to a rather complicated and confusing paradox. It's a little difficult to explain, but I'll try to walk us through it. Um, Iago has pointed out first that all women are different. There are women who are fair, there are women who are black, there are women who are witty, there are women who are foolish, and there's all the different combinations of those traits. But, as he's pointed out in his jokes, all these women, despite their differences, are really identical. Because Wit wittiness, foolishness, fairness, blackness, these are superficial differences that all lead to the same foul pranks. They all do the same things. So all these different signs, they all signify the same truth about women in one sense. And that truth is that all women are duplicitous. They all pretend to fidelity, but they practice infidelity. And he says this again to Othello when he talks about hiding their pranks from all but God. Only God knows the truth. All women hide their sins from their husbands. So he's saying, we men do not know the truth of women because of their duplicity. We can't know what was really going on with a woman because women are always liars and duplicitous. But that then takes us to the next stage, which is essentially how he convinces Othello that Desdemona has cheated on him. Since we do not know what they're really doing, we do know what they're really doing. Since we know that they're duplicitous, we know that they're lying. We know that even the faithful woman is really unfaithful, again, according to Iago's misogynistic and biased logic. So we do know the truth of women. Um, so it's this odd paradox that by pointing out how mysterious and strange and unknowable women are and how their wills are beyond the uh, ability of men to understand, paradoxically then reduces all women to a very easily understandable stereotype that all women are foul, all women are liars, all women are 
unfaithful. Now what happens to Othello as he starts to hear and believe Iago's words? Again, earlier in the play he had said that he was of royal siege, but now in Act 3, as he started to be convinced of Iago's insinuations, he says, talking to himself, happily for I am black, that is, perhaps because I am black, and have not those soft parts of conversation that chamberers have or for I am declined into the veil of years, yet that's not much. So his first four lines, he's talking to himself, saying, saying why is it that she would not love me? Why would she, uh, who once said she loved me and married me, then change her mind and pursue someone else? He says, maybe it's because I am black, and I am not as good a speaker as the Venetian courtiers, or because I'm older. And he says, yet that's not much, but then suddenly he realizes, She's gone. I am abused, and my relief must be to loathe her. So what does he immediately start to identify as the difference in him that makes her leave, that makes her pursue other desires? It's his blackness. He's starting, we might say, to become aware of his blackness, because just like Brabantio had, Iago says over and over again, she is very different from you, though. You are black. You are older. It does make a sort of sense, don't you think? A few lines later, Othello says to Iago, My name that was as fresh as Diane's visage is now begrimed and black as mine own face. This might remind us of Brabantio's fears earlier in the play about his identity, his virtue being transformed by Desdemona's marriage to Othello. And here, Othello, feeling, fearing that his wife has betrayed him, finds his own identity becoming black, becoming fouled. And he says he is, his name was fresh as Diane's visage, Diana, the goddess of the hunt, the goddess of virginity and chastity. Her pure white face has become, uh, and so that's what his name was like, and now his name is begrimed and black as mine own face. So he starts to identify his own blackness as, um, and starts to identify, associate that blackness with uh, negative connotations, with a darkness, with a corruption, and also, in particular, a sexual corruption. Right? He had been fresh as Diane. He had had a sort, certain chastity of his own, a virginity of his own, that has now been taken from him by Desdemona's betrayal, and has made him to become black in name, as he is black in appearance. So we can see Othello start to identify with blackness, start to internalize those cultural ideas of blackness that are being imposed upon him from without. Completing the transformation, Othello says, Now do I see tis true. Look here, Iago. All my fond love thus do I blow to heaven. Tis gone. So he blows away his love for Desdemona. And then he says, Arise, black vengeance, from the hollow hell. So in place of that, love has become, has uh, taken that place, is black vengeance. And the question here is, does this support the idea, the stereotypical idea that Moors or people of black skin are naturally violent? Is that what Shakespeare is trying to signal here? Um, that this is something that was always waiting within Othello? Or is it the hollowness of the hell within? That is the emptiness. Is that suggesting that there is no original blackness in Othello, that whatever blackness might mean in a European perspective, it's not there in Othello, but it must be born, grown, it must emerge, it must be created in order for it to come about. Uh, that's the question, and I think really what Shakespeare is doing is forcing us to ask the question more than anything. Where does identity come from, from within or from without? or some combination of the two. And Othello's change in behavior, of course, has consequences for the other characters. 
uh, when Lodovico, who is sent from Venice to see what's going on, sent with new orders for Othello, uh, he sees Othello strike Desdemona in public, slap her, and he's taken aback by this. He's shocked by this action. He finds it horrific. And after Othello is left, he says to Iago, is this the noble Moor? whom our full senate call all in all sufficient? Is this the nature whom passion could not shake, whose solid virtue the shot of accident nor dart of chance could neither graze nor pierce? So is this who we thought he was? Is this, is this the person who appeared to us so complete, so full, so confident, who was the soldier Othello? Or is he someone else? Is he changed? What has happened to him? Uh, and this sense of being neither grazed nor pierced, right? Now he has been pierced. Something has penetrated his mind, his being. And what is that? Of course, it's Iago. So I've been talking about these paradoxes and the way in which um, Othello's identity is confusingly constructed and that he's both white and black. Um, and so this leads, of course, as he transforms in the course of the play, to Othello's own confusion about his own emotions and a paradoxical mix of love and hate. And so in the final scene, when he goes to murder Desdemona, he says to himself, it is the cause, it is the cause, my soul, that is her infidelity. Let me not name it to you, you chaste stars. It is the cause. Yet I'll not shed her blood nor scar that whiter skin of hers than snow, and smooth as monumental alabaster." So we notice here that Othello wishes to preserve her whiteness. He's still taken with that whiteness, which he finds to be so beautiful, and something pure or holy about it. And he calls it monumental alabaster. He compares it to that, which is a white stone, like a funeral monument. So this can remind us of Hero in Much Ado About Nothing, who, in order to prove her virtue, she has to die and then be resurrected, right? Uh, and her virtue has to be written on her monument, on her gravestone. That is how Claudio proves for all eternity that she really was virtuous, because her gravestone marks it. So that sense that virtue in a woman is only truly preserved or only truly authentic when that woman can no longer potentially act to dispel that virtue, that is, when she's dead. And this idea of death being somehow erotic uh, because it preserves the virtue, the virginity of the white beauty that is what makes her so desirable um, is continued when Othello then says a few lines later, thou cunnest, cunningest pattern of excelling nature, that is her figure, her beautiful body, her form. Be thus when thou art dead, and I will kill thee and love thee after. She seems to him so pure, so beautiful, so innocent when she is lying asleep, because it is like a form of death. She is completely passive. She can't do anything. She can't perform any foul pranks. So he finds his desire aroused by her motionless body. If you are like this when you're dead, I will still love you. If you are without agency, without potential threat of infidelity, I will still love you. But she has to be dead in order for that to occur. Finally, let's look at Othello's self-destruction. He says to the Venetians who have captured him at the end after he's killed um, Desdemona and everything has come to light, he says, just tell people what happened to me. Tell people about my story. And he says, then must you speak of one that loved not wisely, but too well. Of one not easily jealous, but being wrought, perplexed in the extreme." of one whose hand, like the base Indian, threw a pearl away richer than all, her tr all his tribe. And that could also be Judean. It's unclear um, exactly what was intended in the text. It's written in such a way that it could be either word, and different editions have it as either Indian or Judean. And he goes on to say, 
and say besides that in Aleppo once, where a malignant and a turbaned Turk beat a Venetian and traduced the saint, I took by the throat the circumcised dog and smote him thus. And then Othello kills himself, commits suicide as he's describing how he smote the turbaned Turk. So what do we see in this final speech of Othello's? We notice how his identity has been transformed. He's not the same person who he was. And he speaks of himself, at least in part, in the third person, right? He talks about one, as though he is separated from himself. He no longer knows himself quite fully. He is more than one person. He is two people. He's schizophrenic, to use a modern term. And he compares himself to the base Indian or the base Judean, these figures of um, inferiority and racial difference. And he compares his own actions to their folly of throwing away something valuable that they didn't understand. And in his suicide, he becomes the very Turkish enemy that he fights. He's turned into, just like a Turk, a violent, lustful man uh, who can't control his women, an exotic stranger, uh, a foreigner, right? He's become all of these horrible things in the course of the play. And so just as he had killed the Turk, he then kills himself. He says, I smote him thus, and then kills himself in the manner that he killed his enemy. So he is transformed from Venice's savior to the enemy of Venice, but he's still both at the same time. He saves Venice, or so he thinks, by killing himself, by killing the one who's violated the Venetian rule by, of course, killing a Venetian woman. So Othello has been fully transformed again, and in that transformation into quote-unquote blackness, he has been destroyed and destroys himself. So just to review some of the major concepts from this lecture and the others on Othello, um, that connection between blackness and identity and the fears of contamination, the fear of the other contaminating the self. The intersections of race and sexuality, the way in which these two uh, types of identity are mutually reinforcing, that racial racial difference it helps to enact sexual difference and difference the hierarchy of male-female, and the sexual difference of male-female um, is threatened by and is again used to maintain the difference between racial others, white, black, etc. Um, Another important point is Iago's role, and I haven't talked about Iago specifically because he's such a complicated and, and rich character, but um, I encourage you to go back and look through this play and look at the way in which Iago specifically constructs Othello's blackness. How is it that Iago creates the ideas that Othello then internalizes? And again, it's that blackness is um, in, in some sense more external than internal, that really what we see is not in my opinion at least, Othello revealing some internal darkness, but showing the way in which racial identity is imposed from without. Um, and so, as such, he ultimately destroys himself because he internalizes the external. He becomes the figure that is hated and feared by the white Venetians whom he serves, and thus destroys himself to fulfill their desires and, in a way, his own self-destructive desires. So again, last thing I would recommend is going back and looking at Iago and the way Iago's own duplicity works to structure the play and how he, in many ways, displaces his own internal anxieties, his own duplicity, his own lies and, and lack of truth onto other characters.